now at this slide you see two important things preoperative anemia and postoperative anemia and believe it or not but we know now that worldwide about a third of patients coming for elective surgery have anemia when they've been admitted to the hospital had the operation everything then up to 90% of these patients have anemia and we know if you have in the hospital anemia we call it hospital acquired anemia your length of stay increases and also your risk to to attract uh, infection is far higher not changing Changing. I'll do it for you. Okay, because it's not working. That would be nice. Thank you. So, I hope I have convinced you that anemia is a really, really good predictor for bad outcome or the other way around. If you really want to harm yourself, your family or your patients, let them undergo surgery with anemia. But I would like to phrase it a little bit positive there are a lot of options how to treat anemia and what you see now on this graph is preoptively when the decision has been made that the patient will be operated on you can do a pre-op patient blood management checkup and the chance that someone has iron deficiency anemia is so high uh, once you have diagnosed it you can treat it very simple with iron in a hospital setting, we are up to 100%. We prescribe now um, IV intravenous iron, and that can be done even one day before surgery, ideally two to four weeks before surgery. And then there's a second option, a day after the operation, because a lot of patients will have anemia, because we call it hospital-acquired anemia, you can treat again the iron deficiency anemia. So nobody can say, oh, there was not enough time or we didn't know whatever in my personal opinion anemia is a health risk especially when you do interventions on patients so it's not acceptable not to sort out anemia prior any elective interventions next slide please So I briefly would like to run through the three columns of patient blood management. The first one is management of preoperative anemia. Please, next slide. And what we have established in Frankfurt is an anemia walking in clinic. And you can see we have a lot of beach flags and advertisement just to make patients and doctors aware of the fact that is existing, that we're looking after patients, and we have even, as you can see, the T-shirts, everything is according to the subject of anemia, needs to be sorted out. Next slide, please. And I would like to guide you through a small trial which has been uh, done in Australia and published in uh, 2016. It was a randomized controlled trial, and this trial were looking after patients undergoing abdominal surgery. And patients had iron deficiency anemia, and they were randomized in an iron group and in a control group. And patients received about 10 days prior surgery, either iron, IV, or, or nothing. And you can see that after the 10 days, for the surgical case, hemoglobin was significantly increased, but really amazing. The transfusion of red blood cells was reduced by 75%. Hospital lengths of stay from nine days to six days. So that was reason enough for the ethical review board to stop the trial, because they felt that patients with iron deficiency anemia and not being treated with iron were disadvantaged, so the trial was stopped. Next slide, please. We have implemented now um, patient blood management and anemia and the whole process of surgical patients. Because what happens usually, the surgical patient is coming to see a surgeon. The surgeon 
um, is investigating the patient and finally comes to the conclusion this patient needs an operation. Then the patient needs to go through certain procedures. It needs some clinical tests. It needs to be um, signed in for a special day. Then you need a consentment and so on and so on. And we have managed that anemia, the patient blood management uh, walking in clinic, is in particular important and it's been done by every patient in our hospital. And our hospital has 1,500 beds, so we do an over 30,000 operations each year. So that's a main change to the process. Next slide, please. And now I would like to show you what we do with patients. And if you have a planned interven intervention, so any kind of surgery or cardiology or anything, and we have more we have time more than twenty four hours if you go to the top, we know for each procedure in our hospital for the past three years how much blood has been given to a particular procedure. So we defined a risk of transfusion and we defined ten percent as something which is relevant. So it's a risk of transfusion more than ten percent. We would like to know, you see here hemoglobin values according to the um, guidelines from the WHO. And then we do a preoperative anemia management. We do an iron status. Very simple. Doesn't got much money. It can be done very quickly. And then knowing the patient's iron status, we make decisions whether there will be no iron deficiency, so the patient can be operated immediately, or there is iron deficiency, so the patient will be administered um, iron IV, or there are other causes, so we need further diagnostics. Next slide. If the risk of transfusion is higher than 10%, the patient also will be operated on because, um, uh, sorry, lower than 10%, and then the risk of transfusion is lower than 10%, the patient will be operated, and emergencies will be operated as well. So you can see this standard operating procedure makes a huge difference for patients coming for elective surgery. Next slide, please. So this is to summarize for you what it means to have anemia prior surgical intervention. We know now that if you're anemic, you have a 20% longer hospital stay. You have a two-fold increased risk of infection. You have a four-fold increased risk of kidney injury a three-fold increase risk of mortality and a five-fold risk increase in transfusion. So these data are so, so strong. So I'm asking myself, why? We are still doing nonsense operations, elective surgery on patients with anemia. And you can phrase it the other way around because you can say, well, this is basically bad practice, bad medicine, and not good for patients. So it shouldn't be allowed. Next slide, please. Let's quickly talk about intensive care unit. Next slide. This is on my unit. And you see the patient there, right in the middle of all this equipment. And there was a publication some years ago. And what you see here now with my mouse on the left side, you see the axis. These are the hemoglobin levels. And regardless whether you start with a hemoglobin level of 15, 16, or with a level of 7, if you end up on an intensive care unit, you always will have a hemoglobin of 10. So why is that? There are two things. Number one, doctors think 10 is good. There's, there's no proof of this. But it has been published 50 years ago that 10 is good without any evidence. Second, it tells you these people here have been transfused and these people here, what I'll show you later on, they lost their blood. Both are unacceptable. Next slide, please. So what can we do for patients on the intensive care unit? We have to make sure that they are being well prepared. I call this nowadays elective intensive care patients, because we have elective uh, intensive care patients. So you can minimize the blood loss at the beginning, and you can do a lot for the hemoglobin. 
And during the intensive care stay, you have to make sure that you have no GI bleeding, you control, that you don't take too much blood from phlebotomy, you reduce therapeutic interventions, and you keep a really close eye on wound bleeding. Next slide, please. And this is a trial which shows you that you can even treat a day after surgery on the intensive care. This is a study also being published in the year 2016. They were studying 201 patients one day after surgery, also suffering from iron deficiency anemia. Again, they pl uh, compared placebo against iron IV. And they also found the iron group had a faster recovery. The transfusion of red blood cells was reduced from 6 to 1%. But see the next one, post-operative infections from 14% to 2%, and the hospital length of stay from 12 to 8 days. To be fairly honest, ladies and gentlemen, if this is not convincing, then I don't know what to say. Next slide. So there are a lot of reasons for anemia. And let's go to the right side. You have certain things which are acquired. And I think the most famous one is obviously renal anemia. There's some unknown at the bottom. There's some uh, congenital. But the most forms of anemia you find on the left side. This is iron deficiency, vitamin B12 deficiency, folic acid um, deficiency. If you go down, hospital-acquired anemia. And the main one is through blood loss because of diagnostics. So you can see these are a lot of causes, but the most important things on the left side. Next slide, please. And I've shown you this slide before, but I would like to get your attention to the bottom now. And you see here vascular surgery, thoracic surgery, trauma, urology, ops and gyne, and so on. And you see the patients before the surgery, their rate of anemia and after surgery, and you see numbers 85 to 55. So there's a huge increase in the appearance of anemia after surgery, telling you that we lose blood and we do things to our patients we shouldn't do. Next slide, please. What can we do now in terms of minimizing blood loss and bleeding? Next slide. And this is a real life example from my intensive care unit some years ago. We had we have we had admitted two patients, a young man and an elderly lady, both were suffering from severe pneumonia with beginning sepsis. And you see at the top day one to day seven. And this is the amount of blood we have taken in one week. You see it twice laboratory three times the blood culture, 12 times blood gas analysis, and a cross match. And after one week, we have taken 643 mil. That's a, a, a huge amount of blood. So, and the young man had added admission in hemoglobin of 15. After this week, we're just taking blood samples. He had a hemoglobin of 13. And this is according to WHO definition, almost anemic. The elderly lady, she was anemic already with a hemoglobin of 11, and she ended up with 8.5. Next slide. The whole story went worse, ladies and gentlemen. What you can see here now is they both developed a septic shock with multiple organ dysfunction. We were basically with our backs at the wall. We had to implement ECMO and renal replacement therapy. And again, you can see Nine times we have taken blood cultures, 14 times laboratories, 84 times blood cases, once the ECMO clotted, and three times the renal replacement clotted. This is real life. And you can see we have taken from these two humans 1,623 ml of blood in one week. And this lady, do you have any idea how much blood she has? She has only 3,000 ml. And you can see... From a hemoglobin from 15, starting the young man had a hemoglobin of 10. He's severe anemic. And the lady with 11 went down to 4.8. Severe anemic. Next slide, please. So what can we do? And what should we know? And this is data from the U.S. 
from a cardiac unit, patients who underwent cardiac surgery. After surgery, they were bled for um, phlebotomy, just for testing. And it's very simple. You can just recognize if you're 50 days in hospital, you will lose five liters of blood just for diagnostics. And that's your whole blood volume. You basically have an exchange of your blood. And everybody understands that five liters means you will be transfused. Next slide, please. So I personally think we doctors here on the left side, we are vampires. But we should be like little mosquitoes on the right side. We should be very, very careful with patients' blood. We should be very careful with patients anyway. And we should make sure that we take only a minimum of blood, as, as little as possible. And what you see here, these are the typical tubes, which you know from your own experience, and different colors for different testing. And we were talking to a company who was producing them, and we said, look, can you change the inner part of the tubing system so that we just need less blood? Because nowadays with the new machines in clinical chemistry, you don't need much blood anymore for doing all the testing. So they were very helpful. They changed it because if you would change the, the outer side, the robots and machines in clinical chemistry wouldn't be able to handle it. Uh, next slide, and I'll show you what the effect was. Oh, it's not there, but then I'll tell you. The effect was that we were now saving in the University Hospital of Frankfurt almost 2,000 liters of blood. That's the whole SUV full of blood and in weight. The blood we are not taking from our patients. And this is a real step forward to reduce hospital-acquired anemia. Also, what we have Im implemented is to be aware of bleeding in a hospital and how to manage. And this is just the standard operating procedure for medical doctors to follow if there is bleeding which cannot be controlled. And obviously, whenever you have to make sure that is not surgical bleeding, hereafter, you have to make sure that you keep physiology. A cold patient can't clot. But the pH is not right, the blood cannot clot. If calcium is not all right, blood cannot clot. And then obviously you need further information about drug history. And there are certain things you can do. Next slide, please. Let's go to the last point, restrictive use of blood units. Next slide, please. There are a lot of different guidelines. And uh, I'm in particular extremely happy because in Germany since last year, it has been implemented that patient blood management is an important part in the hospital to increase patient safety and to uh, improve patient outcome. Next slide, please. And I will tell you a little story. If we go through a lot of guidelines, everything is written in. If the hemoglobin is less than six, guidelines are basically saying you can transfuse. However, if the hemoglobin is between six and eight, you have to be very, very sure what you're doing. And that means you have to look at your patients. We're treating patients. We are not treating numbers. And the doctor has to tick a box to make sure he's doing the right thing. And over a hemoglobin of eight, there's not really any evidence in terms of benefit for the patient. Next slide, please. And I would like to show you another example what happens if the patient loses blood and needs to be transfused. This was a systematic review and meta-analysis on patients undergoing colorectal cancer surgery. And this there's always two ways to do surgery. You can be very careful. You do it in particular. You make sure that is that you do not lose much blood and so on, or you do it very quickly, not careful, and you transfuse the patient. And this meta-analysis, it came out that at this group of patients who had been transfused had a significant higher risk 
for a reoccurrence of colon cancer. And that frightens me a lot. That frightens me really a lot because it's a, po it's a potential disease condition which can be cured if it's done early. But if you transfuse then, you have a high risk of reoccurrence. So that tells you we have to be very, very careful what we're doing. Next slide, please. So what can be done in a hospital? You need checklists. And I'm a huge fan. Safer surgery is a very good example. And we have our PBM checklist where we tick the box preoperatively, intraoperatively, and postoperatively just to make sure the patient is safe and we're doing the right thing. Next slide, please. Just two, three examples. This was a trial being done in the US. And the question was, does um, a restrictive hemoglobin level have an effect on mortality or morbidity in comparison to a more liberal one? Over 2,000 patients have been enrolled. It was a um, randomized controlled prospective trial. And they compared a hemoglobin of 10 versus 8. And these were patients with a high risk cardiac disease undergoing hip surgery. And you can see if you had if you were in the restrictive group, you haven't had any disadvantage. So there was not a better mobility at thirty or sixty days. And there was no difference in mortality. So to summarize this, a lower hemoglobin is not only safe, it's it has huge advantages when when we're talking about side effects. Next slide please. A trial from Scandinavia three years ago were investigating the same question, a lower or a higher hemoglobin in patients with suffering from septic shock. And again, there was no difference in 90-day mortality or ischemic events if patients were in the lower hemoglobin group. Also demonstrating very, very clear, sometimes less is more. Next slide, please. And this table just summarizes it. In the middle with red with the red digits, these were the lower hemoglobin groups, these were the higher ones. And on the left side you see in in which circumstances the study was done, intensive care unit, cardiac surgery, hip replacement, upper GI bleeding, head injury, septic shock and cardiac surgery. And in all of these trials, the lower hemoglobin group had no disadvantage and some it had even a huge advantage. So the new number for many, many patients is not 10. It's a hemoglobin of 7 to 8. Next slide, please. And this is a particularly interesting trial which just have been published some months ago in November 13th in the New England. These were patients undergoing cardiac surgery. And it was a huge number of patients, as you can see. A restrictive group with 2,430 patients, the hemoglobin of 7.5. And on the right side, the liberal group with 2,430 patients with a hemoglobin of 9.5. And the primary composite endpoint was death, myocardial infarction, stroke, or new onset of renal failure with dialysis. And you can see the liberal group had significantly less of these endpoints, 11.4% versus 12.5. So that tells you and tells me, if we undergo surgery, we do not want to be in the liberal group. We want to be in the restrictive group. And if you look at the mortality, unbelievable, 3% versus 3.6. And the secondary outcome was red blood cell transfusion 52 versus 72. So this is the biggest trial in this direction and absolutely convincing. Next slide please. So how can we get doctors to do the right thing? And I'm a huge fan of training. Training, training, training. And we have set up now a web page is called the Patient Blood Manager. It's also now available in English. It doesn't cost any money, 
but it's hard work. You need a whole day to be able to do four modules. The first one is patient blood management. The second one is anemia. The third one is how to spare blood. And the fourth is transfusion. Next slide. And the point is, in my department, I have over 130 doctors practicing in my department. It is mandatory to do this patient blood manager uh, test. If you don't do it, you're not allowed to transfuse blood because it is a very dangerous drug if it's been used in the wrong way. So I've told you a lot of little things. Now I'm showing you the data of the trial, which we have done some years ago. Uh, you see four centers. And starting 2012, and the four centers were Frankfurt in Germany, Kiel, Bonn, and Münster in Germany. Next slide. And what you can see is that we had a control group. Con control group means business as usual, no patient blood management. Next slide. And you can see in this control phase, we uh, included in the trial over 50,000 patients. And then we had an implementation phase where we um, we're teaching doctors, nurses, health professionals, everything about patient blood management. That took us three months. In Frankfurt alone, we, we were teaching over 800 health professionals. Next slide. And then we were practicing patient blood management. Next slide. And we included in the trial 75,000 patients. Next slide. And now I would like to show you the results. You don't have to say anything, but I'm just telling you. There was before transfusion and after. Next slide, please. And you can see there was a reduction of almost 20% over the whole trial in the amount of blood which has been transfused. In the last quarter of the trial, it was 40%. 40%. Can you imagine? Next slide. Complications. Next slide. There was no difference when we used patient blood management, this was a very important result because it's safe. Next slide. The most surprising data we have obtained from this trial was that we had um, a, a reduction in kidney injury in the patient blood management group by 30%. Next slide. So what does it mean if you suffer from kidney injury in the hospital? It's very simple. If you suffer from kidney injury, you won't produce any urine anymore, and we as doctors do dialysis. And then after several days, your kidney is working again, and everybody's happy we sent you home. But next slide, look what happens, what we never looked at in a proper way. This is years at the bottom, years following discharge. And on the left side, you see patient survivor. If you had in the hospital acute kidney injury, you are dying far more often than patients who had no acute kidney injury. So patient blood management reduces the chance of having acute kidney injury, therefore directly saving lives. Now that is an unbelievable, amazing result. Next slide, please. Money is also an important issue. Next slide. And I'm telling you, if you implement patient blood management in your hospital, you save over 10% of the cost. So it is basically producing money. And at the same time, you're doing better medicine. Next slide. So what can you do to motivate hospitals and to motivate doctors? And I feel it's always the same. We're all a little bit competitive. And we like to have crowns and uh, whatever. So we have founded the idea that we need um, bundles. So we have defined over 150 bundles to implement patient blood management. And you can see the more bundles you have incorporated in your organization, you get certificates. We start with a basic member certificate. Then you receive bronze, silver, gold, platinum, and diamond. And I'm telling you, no one in the world is diamond at the moment. We in Frankfurt were one of the leaders. We are somewhere here. So there's still room for improvement. Next slide. I'm showing you this slide in particular because I'm proud of it. 
and I also would like to motivate you. Within Europe, we set up a network with transfusion medicine because we, we think the whole thing can only work if countries and hospitals are connected. We also have received a grant from the European Union. And in particular, I'm very proud that in 2017, at the Patient Safety Summit in California, we founded the, uh, the World PBM Network. And we have been awarded with the German Prize for Patient Safety and the Humanitarian Award. And I'm particularly very proud of this photograph because my personal experience is he's supporting everything related to patient safety and he's supporting patient blood management. So thank you, Mr. President. Next slide. And I just mentioned it, the World Patient Blood Management Program, which we were lucky and uh, proud to be founded at the Patient Safety uh, Summit. And what we're trying to do with this um, network is to connect hospitals worldwide, to provide them with information, to provide them with help, and finally, to collect data and to calculate numbers of lives saved. And that's so, in particular, important, and I'm very proud of it. Next slide, please. And in closing, two, three more slides. We were able last year to get all surgical societies in Germany and the Society of, in of Anesthesiology Intensive Care to make a statement, a joint recommendation on the subject of patient blood management. And we have published it in our two big journals and it's free access in English and in German and this is basically just a summary of three pages and a fourth page with all the literature, how important it is to implement patient blood management in the hospital. Next slide, please. And finally, I would like to show you a clinical trial we are just running as we speak. It's about patients over 70 years undergoing surgery, non-cardiac surgery. And so far, we have no data in the literature caring for these people. We don't know. Maybe they need a higher hemoglobin. We don't know. Maybe they need a lower hemoglobin. We don't know. And we are asking ourselves, we have transfusion medicine since 70, 80 years, and no one was looking after this particular group of patients. So what we do is what you can see here. Patients will be registered in the trial, and once they're bleeding and the hemoglobin falls below 9, they will be randomized in either um, a liberal group or in a restrictive group. And you can see that we separate both groups very clear. And the end point is after 30 days or hospital discharge, a combination of, of the stroke, myocardial infarction, death, and some others. So hopefully in two years' time, we're aiming to have over 2,000 patients. Hopefully, we can tell you then whether the elderly among us need maybe a different treatment, but uh, I personally don't think so. I think we are on the right way implementing patient blood management also for these patient groups. Next slide. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your attention. I know it's not real life when I'm on the phone line, you see the slides. But I hope I could convince you that everybody can contribute to patient blood management. And this is the real thing to do because it will, if it's done in a proper way, save thousands of lives in each hospital. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kai. Um, even though you aren't here in person and we can't, you can feel the passion that you have around the <laughs> subject. Uh, I hope I speak for everyone who's on the line with us today that uh, we really, really appreciate your enthusiasm, and you've convinced all of us here that are around the table, we're all nodding our heads, that uh, this is something that we should all be working on together. So I'd love to open it up. Um, we do have 10 minutes for questions and answers, so um, I'll be looking at the chat box online if you're too shy to speak up. But at this point, um, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to uh, make yourself aware. So we have oh, I see. A I see the question. I see the question. Oh, what are the risks of IV ion infusion? Very good point. Very good question. 
Um, it depends on which iron formulation you're using. Uh, they, are elder, they are old preparations. Um, it's never the iron, it's always uh, the co-drug. Um, and the, some of the um, older drugs have um, a certain <coughs> sugar transport molecule and there's a high risk of um, um, allergic reactions. The newer preparations, like carboxymaltase or so on, they have a very low risk. They have also the risk of allergic reactions, but a very low one. And obviously, if you're not able to um, inject it in a, in a vein and you inject it in, in tissue, it can be very painful and discolorization. Thank you. Any other questions out there? Alicia, I see that you uh, typed in your name, but I wasn't sure if you had any specific question or not. Yes, uh, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Oh, thank you. First of all, I just want to say wonderful presentation, Kai. You know, I'm a, a big fan of yours and the work that you do. And um, so I just love the information and I love the results that you're getting as a uh, survivor of multiple hospital acquired infections. You know, I've had 11, <clears throat> excuse me, 11 blood transfusions over the last 10 years. Um, I know. And so, you know, one of the things I've noticed is that whenever I am sick, whether I had a, I had a, um, a stomach virus earlier this year, um, I just got back from the summit in London, and unfortunately, I had bronchitis when I returned because I my immune system has been greatly compromised. But I find that now I am prone. I can tell in my own body when I am anemic and when my iron is deficient. The last time I was in the hospital, they kept me an extra day just pumping blood, iron through the IV and all of the nutrients in my blood that were missing. And so it's, it's from a patient perspective, this work is so vitally important. And I'm glad to see that you carried it out years later to look at the morbidity and mortality of it. And I wanted to know, were there other side effects or things that you also found um, as you looked at long-term results of some of um, the, the blood transfusions and the anemia yes, and those yes, type yes. things? Thank you very much, Alicia. It's so wonderful to hear your voice and to, to know that you feel uh, better now. Um, research has to be said in the long term effect. There's not much research being done. And that's what I don't understand, because we transfuse, we transfuse humans since 70 or 80 years. No one has really looked at the long-term effects. Uh, what happened after 10 years? No one. What we know is, with each transfusion, the immune system is compromised, and people have um, basically a par paralysis of the immune system. And that is the re one of the reasons why uh, patients will attract easier infections. But also we have, there's some evidence, it's not 100% proven, but uh, there are strong indicators for that, that if you have, or if you might have cancer, and if it's only a small one, no one has detected so far, and your immune system goes down, the cancer has better chance to multiply and to spread. And there are some other things as well, which... Um, the transfusion goes along because we know that when you get a red blood cell transfusion, you're also being transfused white blood cells. Although nowadays the production of red blood cells is far better, the quality is far better, and it's obviously life savings in a lot of situations. But you get white blood cells, and these white blood cells, obviously, they are from a donor, and these white blood cells will detect that your cells, your own body cells, are foreign. So you will have a little explosion in your body because two immune systems are fighting against each other. The third thing, what we know from transfusion is it is associated with increased risk of myocardial infarction, stroke, and some other things. And I can tell you a true story from my own family. It happened last week. A father was admitted in my hospital Two weeks ago, he's living uh, abroad, 
and she had an emergency procedure where I was anesthetizing him and the second one a week later and he was really anemic and I had to transfuse him and after 35 hours after uh, the, the transfusion he was suffering from a stroke so we did all the investigation you have to do um, is he suffering from endocarditis has he any atrial fibrillation or any other cause or anything we could we could rule out everything so now our diagnosis is um, a co co coagulopathy, so coagulation problems related to transfusion because he had an embol emboli in his brain. So it's a lot of things at the moment for all of you, but um, I don't want that you think that transfusion overall is a, is a bad thing. Transfusion is saving lives, and that is important to know. But wrong transfusions, the wrong patient for the wrong indication it can be dangerous. Thank you, Kai. You're welcome, Alicia. I see um, another okay. um, question. Uh, the there's top. a question I can see. Where can people go for more information or to read the recent study? Very simple. If you go on the web page, patient blood management, and, and one word, .eu for European Union, you find a lot of information. You even get two 45-minute uh, minute documentaries, the links. They are also been uh, basically in English. And you find a lot of other things, information, links, and so on. It's highly recommendable. Go to patientbloodmanagement.eu for European Union. Amazing. Great. Great. Well, we still have three minutes. Any other questions from those of you who out on the web. Sounds Hi. like that everybody's happy. <laughs> oh, I did hear some voice. Uh, I, well, I, I'll, since we have some time, I have a follow-up question. How do you feel about banking blood Prior to a surgery, patients banking their own blood in anticipation of the possible need for it or perhaps a family member uh, so that the blood is as close a match as possible. Yeah, um, uh, there are two things. Um, banking your own blood prior a procedure is not recommended anymore. And the reason being is very simple. By the time your blood has been taken from you, you will lose blood and for you to reproduce this blood so that you have a normal blood, a red blood cell mass takes time it takes up to two or three weeks and the blood you have banked has only a certain amount of time where you can transfuse it so that means on one side you take a blood bank it on the other side you're getting anemic it's not a very good idea and the third thing is, what well, that happened quite often, that although it's your blood, you have banked it and you have done everything, um, sometimes it happened and um, you can look at the literature, people got the wrong blood. So there was a chance you received blood from someone else and not the blood you have basically banked for yourself. So it's unbelievable. So I'm not in favor of this anymore. But there are certain exceptions. If you have a very rare blood group, that could make sense. Um, also, that a family member might be able to, to provide blood, but these are really exceptions. Otherwise, nowadays, with our knowledge we know, it's not recommended anymore. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I don't know if we have time for one more question, but there's uh, one in the chat room. How much iron pre-op is sufficient? Oh, yes, I can see. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you for the question. Um, that depends a little bit on the iron deficiency anemia, the, the grade of the, the amount. So um, usually 500 milligram up to 1,000 milligram is sufficient. It's really depending on the body weight and um, iron status. Great. Well, it's the top of the hour. I really appreciate um, everyone getting on the line and on the web today to hear Professor Kai Zakharowski speak. Kai, thank you so much. Um, again, we uh, always enjoy hearing you speak and uh, inspiring people to make changes that can really make a big impact on patient 
care. Um, we will be sending out a survey to those of you who provided your email so that you can give us some feedback on our webinars to make them better in the future. And we hope that you will join us for our next webinar. Um, more information is on our website, but it'll be in June. So thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day, and we will hopefully uh, see you again soon.